All right, I think we'll get started. So welcome everyone to a, another webinar in our 2020 Diabetes Canada webinar series. We're very excited about today's topic on Diabetes Canada's position statement on low carb diets presented by Harpreet Bajaj and Catherine Chan. Um, pretty exciting topic. I know there's lots of chatter and buzz and conversation going on about low carb diets. So it uh, should be a great webinar. We're just going to start today by getting a sense of who's in the audience. So we're just going to do some polling questions. So um, our first polling question um, is going to be, we just would like to know what profession uh, you are. So I'm just going to launch um, the poll here. And we'll give you about 30 seconds to um, answer the poll. And then we'll take a look at our results. Great, so thanks for sharing with us. Um, I think as some of us might have expected today, we have uh, more than 50% of our participants are registered dietitians today, 57%. We have uh, about a quarter of our participants are registered nurses. We have 10% pharmacists, and we also have some family physicians, uh, researchers, scientists, and a couple of uh, folks who would classify themselves as other. So thank you very much. And we're just gonna do another question. We'd just like to see where you are dialing in from today. Where are you viewing the presentation from? Great, so thanks again. Um, pretty typical for our webinar series to have most people viewing from Ontario, um, but as is a pattern, we have representation from every province across the country. So that's really, uh, I think, neat to see, really interesting. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. So thanks for participating in those sort of demographic questions. We really appreciate it. And so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Catherine and Harpreet. All right, well, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to the webinar that Harpreet and I are delivering today. Um, my name is Kathy Chan. I'm a professor of nutrition and physiology at the University of Alberta and I'm going to uh, take the first part of the webinar and then I'm going to pass over to um, Harpreet to deliver the second half of the seminar. Oh, there we go. So we have one more question uh, for polling, and that is uh, when you consult with people with diabetes, do you often recommend a very low carbohydrate diet? Sometimes recommend a very low carbohydrate diet, never recommend a very low carbohydrate diet, or this is not applicable for my practice. Okay, so about half um, say that they sometimes recommend a low carb diet, uh, but a third never recommend uh, a low carb diet. So um, that's interesting to know just starting out um, before we begin to discuss the evidence um, that was assembled um, in order to create the uh, position statement for Diabetes Canada. So what Harpreet and I are going to cover today is a brief overview of the 2018 Clinical Practice Guidelines Nutrition Therapy Chapter and what those guidelines say about low-carbohydrate diets. 
then the uh, why uh, Diabetes Canada decided to develop a position statement for low carbohydrate diets. And at that point, I'm going to turn it over to Harpreet, who will provide a summary of the uh, studies that were included in the position statement, what the recommendations in that statement are, and then a little bit about putting it all into perspective and some practical tips. So I was an author on the 2018 nutrition therapy chapter, along with John Stephen Piper, uh, Paula Dwartzik, Catherine Field, and Sandra Williams. And as per Diabetes Canada protocol for the development of the clinical practice guidelines, we went through a stringent methodology in order to develop the recommendations. Initially, over 60,000 papers were identified that had the search terms that we included. But fortunately, we were able to get rid of a lot of them without um, too much effort and eventually ended up with about 360 papers that we did conduct a full review of. However, most of those were also uh, not um, meeting our strict inclusion criteria. And so we ended up with 38 new papers after the 2013 guidelines that ended up informing the new uh, or revised uh, nutrition therapy guidelines in 2018. But a limitation of producing guidelines is that it takes a long time to go through all of this um, screening and reviewing and then extracting the information that we need and um, doing the actual writing. And so the papers that we included in the recommendations were published up to 2016. And so a lot of new information in even in the two years between 2016 and 2018, when the guidelines were published, was not included. In the 2018 guidelines, we summarized some key messages for healthcare professionals. And I'm sure um, since half of you are dietitians, you're very familiar with this um, key message section. So first and foremost, people with diabetes should reach receive nutrition counseling by a registered dietitian. The important message that nutrition therapy is effective in reducing hemoglobin A1C by up to 2%. That reduced caloric intake for those with overweight and obesity can be helpful in uh, diabetes management. And I think what's important for our webinar today, that dietary pattern can be flexible depending on individual values, goals, and preferences. And it's up to the uh, multidisciplinary team caring for people with diabetes to determine how best to fit a diet into those uh, individual values, goals, and preferences. And then finally, general dietary goals uh, primarily focus on uh, low glycemic index carbs, consistent spacing of carbs, and uh, if possible, combining dietary intervention with intensive behavior intervention for the best outcomes. Along with the key messages for healthcare professionals, we included some uh, messages for people with diabetes as well, because Diabetes Canada recognizes that uh, some people with diabetes do read the guidelines as an adjunct uh, to their uh, treatment from their healthcare team. So again, consulting with a registered dietitian, the role that food can play in diabetes management and risk reduction, uh, kind of echoing uh, Health Canada's new Canada's Food Guide, the idea that preparing foods at home and eating together as a family can be beneficial. The notion that a small weight loss may help to normalize blood glucose um, and picking a strategy that you can stick with, not just for three months, but for the long term. And that specific foods or dietary patterns can be helpful also in normalizing blood glucose. Some of the things that were new in the 2018 
guidelines included the uh, recommendation for reduced caloric intake for those with overweight and obesity based on some emerging evidence. Uh, again, a real focus and emphasis on the idea that dietary patterns can be flexible. There was an increased emphasis on ethnocultural diversity to recognize that uh, Canadians speak over 240 languages, I believe, at birth. And, um, and so uh, practice many different um, food practices and uh, that that needs to be taken into consideration in order for uh, people with diabetes to accept the diet that's recommended to them and then to adhere to it over the long term. And then we tried to predict what the implications of the 2019 Canada's Food Guide might be, although that is an ongoing um, piece of work for people at Diabetes Canada. So I'm just going to run through some of the dietary patterns that were uh, mentioned in the 2018 uh, guidelines and what some of their uh, benefits were judged to be based on the literature. So we talked about uh, several different um, dietary patterns based on macronutrients, so low GI diets, that's low glycemic index diets, high fiber diets, high, uh, diets high in monounsaturated fatty acids, low carbohydrate diets were mentioned, and uh, high protein diets as well. And so you can see from the table that um, Several of the diets were deemed to have benefits on hemoglobin A1C, specifically low GI and high fiber diets and uh, high protein diets, whereas the evidence at that time suggested that diets high in monounsaturated fatty acids and uh, low carbohydrate diets didn't necessarily benefit A1C, but could have other benefits, for example, on triglycerides um, or weight or blood pressure. And then uh, the disadvantages were also um, listed. But I just wanted to point out that low carbohydrate diets were uh, specifically mentioned in the 2018 guidelines. Uh, some other dietary patterns and popular weight loss diets were also mentioned. So the Mediterranean diet perhaps has the most evidence of the um, dietary patterns that are out there. Uh, lower a A1C lowering impact as well as cardiovascular benefit. Although we said there were no disadvantages, um, certainly from a health standpoint, but uh, financially it may be difficult for individuals to purchase uh, olive oil, which costs eight times as much as uh, comparable um, other oils that are uh, made from oil seeds grown in Canada. Uh, we mentioned vegetarian diets as having a benefit on A1C. Uh, DASH diets is not necessarily benefiting A1C, but having other uh, benefits on uh, cardiovascular risk factors. Amongst the popular diets, we uh, listed five and uh, do mention the Atkins diet, which is a low carbohydrate diet. Studies of the Atkins diet did not suggest a benefit on A1C, but there were some advantages on some of the other cardiovascular risk factors. So once we had gone through all of the evidence and looking at the different dietary patterns, then we had to review all of the recommendations from the 2013 guidelines and decide whether we needed to modify or include new recommendations. And the one that's most relevant to today's discussion is recommendation number eight, which was modified. And we modified it to reflect the idea that it's not, perhaps not the amount of carbohydrates and the amount of fat that we should be talking about in individuals' diet, as much as the quality of the fats and the carbohydrates. And so, to recommendation number eight, we added that if individuals um, can be uh, persuaded to reduce their uh, energy intake from saturated fatty acids, uh, 
which do have cardiovascular risk, that these should be replaced with polyunsaturated fatty acids, particularly mixed omega-3, omega-6 sources and monounsa or monounsaturated fatty acids from plant sources or whole grains or low glycemic index carbohydrates. So again, just emphasizing quality over quantity. So 2018 came and went with the launch of the uh, new guidelines. But according to people I talked to at Diabetes Canada, the phone was ringing nearly every day and emails were um, being received from individuals who wanted more information on low carbohydrate diets. And this is partly because uh, such diets have enjoyed uh, quite a resurgence in recent years amongst the general population, people looking to control their body weight and for people with diabetes looking to control their blood sugar. So people with diabetes and the healthcare professionals caring for them wanted guidance from Diabetes Canada on low carbohydrate diets. And of course, as I mentioned, we stopped um, reviewing literature in 2016, which is what the red line on this chart represents. But evidence about um, all the different diets, of course, continues to grow and evolve. And you can see that um, there's been, along with the resurgence in, in the general public's interest in low carbohydrate diets, there's been a resurgence or an increase in interest by scientists. And you can see that the slope of this uh, increasing number of papers being published started to increase sharply right around uh, 2016. So it seemed likely that more evidence would be accumulating on these diets. Moreover, several other jurisdictions uh, began to publish position statements on low carbohydrate diets for people with diabetes. And this is just highlighting Diabetes UK, which was published in May 2017. But Australia and a joint statement from the ADA Americans and the Europeans uh, also came out around the same time. So this is about the time that Diabetes Canada convened the working group that uh, was charged with reviewing the new evidence that had been uh, brought forth since the 2018 guidelines had been formulated. So at this point, I'm going to uh, turn the microphone over to my colleague Harpreet uh, to review the evidence with you. All right, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Kathy, for that uh, and all the work uh, that you and all the all the all your co-authors did uh, for the uh, the nutrition chapter uh, for the 2018 uh, guidelines. Um, it seems like uh, it's only uh, you know two years old, but as you pointed out, uh, uh, the data summaries and uh, based on which uh, these recommendations uh, are made. Uh, was more than two years uh, old. So it was about three, three and a half years old. And so, uh, of course, there has been uh, more literature since then uh, looking at this specific uh, um, uh, uh, part of the nutrition, if you will. Uh, in relation to diabetes, uh, there have been some new uh, data that had been published as well. Um, so we, uh, or Diabetes Canada, decided that uh, uh, we should do a, a fresh literature uh, search uh, into this uh, topic uh, and see what we could find and see if there was a need uh, for a new position statement uh, just on this uh, topic uh, as such. So I'm going to share uh, some of the some of the recommendations, but before that, I'll I'll share some of the uh, methods that were used for this position statement, as well as uh, some of the data that was used uh, to make those uh, recommendations as well. But before I do that, uh, I'll just point out that, uh, as Kathy mentioned, uh, uh, diets are a com complex issue. Uh, it, it needs, we need to, uh, and, and all of you do that uh, every day uh, when you're in, in your clinic or otherwise as well, is uh, take into consideration so many different uh, factors uh, that play a role as to uh, what diet may work uh, 
for an individual for a certain time period, et cetera, as well. So keep that in mind uh, when we talk about uh, this uh, position statement that is new uh, as well. All right, so uh, for those of you who have not uh, had a chance to uh, look at this uh, position statement, you can view it, uh, you can uh, download it from this uh, uh, web address. Uh, the DOI number is uh, given. Uh, it's a freely downloadable, downloadable uh, uh, version PDF from the Canadian Journal of uh, Diabetes. Uh, it was published about two months ago online and it, it should appear in the print um, depending on how, how much backlog they have within the next six months or so. And this uh, was a completely uh, collaborative uh, effort. Uh, so thank you, Kathy, and thank you to all the uh, participants who contributed to uh, making this uh, position statement. All of them are listed. Also, uh, there was external reviews uh, that were done and uh, truly a multi-disciplinary uh, 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 kind of a, a development committee as well as external reviews uh, as well. Specifically, the purpose of this uh, position statement is to uh, uh, look at the evidence and summarize uh, based on carbohydrate uh, content of the diet. Um, so there are various definitions, uh, but the uh, most accepted uh, definitions are on this uh, slide, which is low carbohydrate uh, intake is between 51 to 130 uh, grams per day. And then very low carbohydrate uh, uh, content is less than 50 uh, grams uh, per day. Uh, which uh, uh, then can lead to ketosis versus not, right? And uh, uh, so we were, uh, the purpose was to look at uh, the evidence in support of these in management of people diagnosed with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and then to provide some practical recommendations to uh, uh, people with diabetes as well as uh, practitioners uh, regarding the utilization of, the, of this uh, dietary pattern, uh, uh, specifically to... Uh, uh, address uh, some of the uh, some of the issues that Kathy pointed out. Uh, so uh, to facilitate multidisciplinary uh, team engagement in terms of uh, dietary interventions as such, uh, there were some interprofessional tensions that were developing. Um, some people uh, were entrusted in trying these diets, uh, whereas uh, uh, they were told uh, by their healthcare providers uh, that uh, this is not the right diet, Diabetes Canada does not recommend it, et cetera. And so that kind of tension uh, uh, was uh, one of the reasons for this uh, position statement. And then to identify key safety issues and clinical monitoring requirements, I think is a big one because uh, um, uh, we will go over the data and the recommendations, uh, but uh, the first thing we want to do is to provide safety uh, with any kind of diet and specifically uh, diets that can lead to uh, ketosis uh, or to low carbohydrate leading to hypoglycemia. So that was also a, a major purpose uh, for these uh, recommendations. Uh, in terms of methods, um, so uh, uh, this uh, MERST uh, uh, team, which is based on McMaster, uh, was... Uh, uh, was the one involved in searching. Uh, so they did uh, database searches uh, specifically for low carb or keto kind of uh, uh, research that had been done. Uh, their focus on, was on publications since 2016 and beyond because that's when the last uh, nutrition chapter, um, uh, all the research had focused on until 2016. And so beyond that, whatever was published uh, was what the focus was. And then they did, uh, the MERS team did a critical appraisal uh, and provided reports uh, to uh, the authors of this position statement, uh, so to us. And then we uh, looked through that uh, critical appraisal, we added some more citations, uh, and Kathy did a great job uh, uh, facilitating this. Uh, she created uh, extraction tables uh, for all the research, so we could uh, have uh, all of the research in one place and compare across uh, studies and meta-analyses, uh, et cetera, as well. Uh, so that was very helpful. And then finally, uh, the committee agreed on uh, recommendations. Now here's uh, some limitations or how uh, this was done. Of course, uh, you know, there's no high quality evidence uh, for low carbohydrate diet. Uh, so that is one of the limitations, but that's one of the limitations in any kind of diet uh, uh, studies in, in a major part as well, right? Uh, so there's not multiple uh, randomized, large, uh, uh, long outcome trials uh, with, with most of the diets uh, that, we, uh, that we do uh, recommend and, uh, and suggest to our, uh, our uh, uh, clients as such, right? Um, 
So uh, in terms of methods uh, for this uh, position statement, uh, this is, uh, these are consensus recommendations uh, and uh, they did not undergo uh, the formal grading or independent methods review uh, like the nutrition chapter uh, did because uh, this is a position statement, this is not a chapter uh, revision uh, as such. So here's some of the data then, uh, which uh, I'm showing you a table that Kathy had uh, generated a part of the table that focuses on type one diabetes uh, studies that have been done um, in, in, uh, with the low carbohydrate versus uh, very low carbohydrate uh, diets. Um, and so uh, in, if you look at the data and Kathy, this was very useful uh, when we looked at especially type one because uh, there's only limited studies in type one that have been uh, done. I'll point out the, the first one, which is uh, actually a randomized trial, but a small randomized trial with an N of 10 uh, people with type one diabetes, uh, but all of them completed this uh, trial. And they tried to get to a, a, an average uh, a carbohydrate load of 75 grams per day, um, but they achieved a 100, around a 103 grams per day uh, average uh, carbohydrate load uh, during this uh, randomized trial. What's also important is a comparator group. Uh, so they were compar comparing against uh, uh, what is considered the gold standard, right? So the carbohydrate counting uh, group was a comparator. Um, so people with type one diabetes who were good with carbohydrate counting, uh, they would adjust uh, their insulin doses based on that carbohydrate counting. And then the, uh, the uh, low carbohydrate group would try to uh, do that and try to lower the carbohydrate uh, content of the diet as well. So that comparison then uh, led to an A1C lowering was the, was the final conclusion on this uh, small trial. There was no change in weight, uh, total cholesterol, triglycerides, et cetera, uh, during this trial. There was actually no change in glycemic variability uh, that was seen. Uh, there was some decrease in insulin dose uh, that was uh, seen in this uh, trial. Um, so that's uh, what uh, this uh, trial uh, helps us uh, with. The other two studies uh, at the bottom of the slide uh, with type one, uh, in type one uh, as well. Um, the second study uh, by Nelson is a retrospective chart review, uh, about 48 adults, uh, type one diabetes. Uh, it was a four year uh, adherence uh, was measured as well. And you can see the, uh, the carbohydrate content that they were uh, uh, trying to get to, uh, target to was 75 grams per day. Uh, they also found that people uh, with this uh, kind of a carbohydrate uh, diet, um, they had a reduction of A1C, uh, but not if you're not adherent to the diet. So if people were not adherent to the diet, they did not uh, get that uh, benefit uh, as such. Additionally, they saw some HDL increase uh, as well. And then the third uh, is just a survey. It's not a study as such, uh, but the survey is important. Uh, the question was, uh, is uh, uh, low carbohydrate diet even fe feasible in people with type 1 diabetes or not. And uh, in this uh, kind of a uh, survey, they were actually uh, able to achieve a, a very low carbohydrate diet um, uh, while maintaining the A1C in a large uh, number of uh, uh, people uh, with uh, uh, type 1 uh, diabetes. Assets. So that was the data for type 1. In terms of type two diabetes, there's a larger body of literature uh, that is uh, available uh, at this time uh, for uh, low or very low carbohydrate diets. Um, so specifically, I will not go into all the studies. You can read up uh, on all of the studies in the, in the uh, PDF version that is available uh, for you to download. Uh, but I'll just mention two of the meta-analyses uh, that were published uh, and they were published after uh, the CPG guidelines uh, on nutrition chapter were made av available. So these two meta-analysis uh, then uh, examine randomized control trials, uh, focusing on three carbohydrate patterns uh, and compare it to a control uh, diet. Uh, so they uh, looked at very low carbohydrate uh, uh, pattern, which was less than 50 grams per day, uh, low carbohydrate, which as we said, 50 to 130, or those with more than 130 or the moderate carbohydrate uh, diet uh, pattern. So in this um, um, uh, meta-analysis, these two meta-analysis, uh, basically uh, to sum up uh, the low carbohydrate diets, uh, if you look at, uh, they uh, do show a reduction of A1C as well as weight up to six months uh, duration of the trials. And then very low carbohydrate itself 
uh, was uh, uh, leaning towards an improvement on the A1C, but then it did not meet statistical significance. Uh, probably the authors uh, mentioned that probably because of sample size, they didn't have enough, uh, uh, enough trials that have been done with enough people uh, to suggest uh, uh, that there was statistically significant lowering in this uh, population with very low carbohydrate diet. So maybe a sample size limitation. Uh, moderate carbohydrate diet uh, had a similar A1C and weight uh, to the control diet. Uh, so there was no difference uh, in, this, in these, these meta-analyses uh, as such. So that was uh, what formed the basis uh, of um, at least the literature that had been uh, accumulated until uh, this position statement uh, was, uh, was uh, devised. And then we looked uh, for what else uh, should be considered uh, beyond the A1C and weight. Uh, there were some other studies uh, that have uh, suggested uh, reduced glucose lowering medications. Um, so some studies had people in early diabetes, especially uh, type two diabetes, uh, that uh, uh, glucose lowering medications were reduced or even stopped in some, uh, some of those uh, studies, uh, mostly retrospective studies, so uh, limited observational uh, there. Uh, also reduced triglycerides and quality of life Im improvement were the other things uh, that were mentioned in, in some of these uh, other studies uh, that, that we looked at in type two diabetes uh, specifically. In addition to the uh, studies itself, uh, we thought of some cautions and safety uh, that should be considered uh, before making the recommendations uh, that we're gonna speak about in the next uh, slide. Uh, so some of those uh, cautions and safety features included um, a consideration of their antihypoglycemic therapies. So specifically, if they're on uh, drugs that can lower the glucose and cause hypoglycemia, so insulin or sulfonylurea, uh, you know, they may need to be reduced. Uh, so that was one of the things that we kept in mind. Also, there is some literature around SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, which are gaining more popularity uh, in general, but SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, uh, rare, have a rare side effect of, uh, of diabetes ketoacidosis. And uh, there is some literature, though not uh, of very high quality or, or a large number of randomized trials or anything, uh, that suggests that because uh, very low carbohydrate diets can lead to ketosis and, and SGLT2 inhibitors can lead to uh, ketosis in certain rare con con uh, uh, conditions as well, then maybe the combined uh, kind of risk is increased. And so that was also a background uh, thought that we had uh, for the recommendations. Also in terms of hypoglycemia specifically, there's some mechanistic uh, kind of uh, considerations which are mentioned uh, here. Uh, so ketonemia, so ketosis uh, itself, uh, may impair the awareness of hypoglycemia. So that could be a concern uh, for people. Uh, also uh, reduced effectiveness may be there for glycogen uh, uh, because of less glycogen stores. Uh, so somebody who has less glycogen stores because of low carbohydrate intake, maybe glucagon therapy may not be as effective then for a hypo uh, treatment uh, as well. So that was also a consideration. And then uh, finally, and Kathy, uh, Kathy mentioned this uh, very elo eloquently that, uh, you know, healthy nutrition is more than just uh, macronutrient uh, content, right? Uh, there's many different things that need to be considered and also uh, healthy eating is uh, not just about weight. Um, so just a fixation on weight is not uh, what healthy eating should be uh, considered to be. It's much more beyond uh, uh, than that as well. And then uh, the other nutrition pieces uh, that were uh, considered uh, for these recommendations were changing in changes in fiber, micronutrients, or the quality of uh, macronutrients uh, as well. So that was the basis of the recommendations and the recommendations you'll realize are quite generic. And uh, of course, uh, the rec any recommendations from the guidelines are guidelines, then uh, healthcare providers like us and like you, uh, then you take those into consideration when you're uh, helping uh, uh, the patient that is in front of you uh, to see if uh, one or other things uh, should be considered depending on the individual uh, situation, right? So here's the first recommendation, which is uh, individuals with diabetes should be supported to choose healthy eating patterns that are consistent with their individual values uh, and goals and preferences. So this is what Kathy had mentioned in the nutrition chapter, and this is carried over. 
that um, uh, you know individuals' choices, preferences, uh, as well as uh, goals, uh, etc., should be uh, should be kept into consideration uh, when we are uh, suggesting or recommending for or recommending against a certain uh, diet as such. Specifically regarding the low and very low carbohydrate diet, this is how the recommendation two uh, kind of um, is uh, framed. Uh, so healthy and healthy is with a star and you can read the star at the bottom, uh, which I'll read for you, uh, that uh, Canadians with or without diabetes uh, who prefer to adopt a low or very uh, low carbohydrate diet pattern should be encouraged to consume a variety of foods as recommended in uh, the Canada's food guide. And then the recommendation itself reads that with this healthy consideration, low and very low carbohydrates uh, diets can be considered as one of the healthy, uh, healthy eating pattern for individuals living with type one and type two diabetes uh, for weight loss, improved glycemic control, and to reduce uh, and or to reduce the need of antihypoglycemic uh, therapies. And individuals uh, should consult uh, with their healthcare provider to define uh, their goals for this and to reduce the likelihood of uh, adverse effects uh, to keep safety uh, in the forefront. And the next two recommendations actually go over those safety uh, things uh, as such. So recommendation number three uh, specifically uh, provides or talks about uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, we talked about sulfonylurea and insulin, uh, that uh, these doses may need to be adjusted or sulfonylurea may need to be uh, discontinued. But then uh, insulin uh, should not be underdosed as well because it can increase the risk of uh, diabetes ketoacidosis, especially with, uh, in those who have uh, higher insulin sensitivity or people with type one diabetes, of course. Uh, so that was a key uh, recommendation in there. And then um, uh, also to ensure adequate intake of fiber and nutrients uh, in, in that as well. Uh, so these include micronutrients, uh, vitamins, uh, minerals uh, as well. And then the fourth recommendation, and I skipped over the SGLE2 part in the, in the third one as well, uh, relates to specifically that risk of euglycemic uh, DKA. Uh, it's a rare condition, but then again, we need to be very careful, especially if uh, people are going to go very low on their carbohydrate and go into ketosis, um, then uh, you may consider uh, you know, either reducing the dose of the SGLT2 inhibitor or even stopping it in certain conditions. Uh, we know that SGLT2 inhibitors have cardiovascular disease benefits uh, in, the, in the secondary prevention population. So those who've had previous cardiac disease or stroke uh, or peripheral vascular disease, uh, and they may have kidney benefits uh, as well. So they're not just used for glucose control, uh, but also for the other benefits. The kidney benefits are in specific uh, people, people who, uh, you know, who may have high uh, protein leakage, proteinuria and low EGFR. So in that kind of population, so we need to kind of balance out um, uh, whether that benefit uh, outweighs any risks of continuing with that SGLT2 inhibitor. So it'll have to be an uh, individual, uh, individualized uh, decision, uh, but we'll need a multidisciplinary approach uh, what to do with that SGLT2 inhibitor in a certain uh, patient uh, that you're caring for. And then uh, the last part about this recommendation was strategies to mitigate the risk of uh, euglycemic DKA. Um, so uh, this includes if somebody gets sick, uh, so the SADMAN uh, acronym comes in that uh, SGLT2 inhibitors should not be given if somebody's vomiting, dehydrated, et cetera, they should be held so the, uh, so the person with diabetes should be educated to, to hold that uh, SGLT2 inhibitor uh, if that was the case uh, as well, for example. Right? And then the last recommendation, I think is the crux of it, that um, uh, people with diabetes who want to begin a low carbohydrate diet should seek a support uh, from a dietitian who can help them create a culturally appropriate, enjoyable, and a sustainable plan as well. And this would be uh, you know, important uh, when somebody's initiating such a diet or even when they're coming off such a diet to a different kind of diet as well. Okay? Uh, so that's what uh, is the final recommendation that, um, uh, that uh, was there in the position uh, statement. Now with this, uh, I'll just point out some of the limitations in all of this and what we think uh, are the future directions 
so this is there in the in the PDF uh, as well. The future directions that have been uh, suggested, and hopefully we get uh, our wish list uh, in the future uh, for some of these uh, uh, things that have been suggested. Uh, these include long-term studies of safety and efficacy of uh, such a diet and any other diets that we think uh, are good uh, for people as well. And then uh, uh, most of these studies that we looked at included people specifically for their weight uh, control. So these are motivated people who uh, may have a more, more motivation to lose weight and that's why they're uh, enrolled in these studies. So we suggested that include people living with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, uh, irrespective of their weight. Uh, also, there is some interest in prevention of diabetes itself or reducing the progression of diabetes. Uh, and so that uh, may be something uh, of interest. And then the last part is about healthcare providers. Uh, uh, it's basically, should we strive to engage with, uh, with our patients in supportive relationships which, uh, which result uh, in, uh, which respect shared uh, decision-making? And that's, uh, you know, a change in mindset is what this is talking about. Now, I can, I have to be frank here, you know, five years ago, uh, and I remember clearly uh, one of my, uh, my patients uh, said that, uh, you know, I want to try this very low carbohydrate diet. And I clearly remember, you know, this patient uh, with type 2 diabetes uh, has uh, is on insulin and uh, multiple other oral uh, drugs as well. And so at that time, um, uh, you know, I, I suggested that this was not the right approach uh, and there was no recommendations for that uh, uh, at this time. So I desisted basically, uh, you know, from uh, doing that. Anyway, he, uh, you know, said, I'm going to try it anyway, uh, you know, uh, whether you uh, support me or guide me or advise me or not, is what he decided. He didn't say it to me that clinic visit. But then uh, when this person came back uh, the next time, he said, oh, I tried it and I feel better. My sugars are better. My weight is better. So I kind of like was, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever your motivation is, it may be that we need to learn and have an open mind uh, to such uh, conversations uh, at times as well, because stagnancy, especially in the diet field, uh, I feel uh, when we don't have very high quality literature and dietary advice and pieces keep changing over time, uh, you know, we need to uh, maybe be more, more humble. I have, I've just, I've, tried to be more humble and, and uh, open-minded uh, as such uh, following that uh, encounter. Now, with that in mind, I'll show you this uh, quote, uh, which is, uh, uh, if you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. Um, so if you take this quote and put it into type two diabetes uh, as an example, and how look at how evolution of uh, diabetes management has been, type two diabetes management, over the past uh, two, three decades uh, as such. Uh, I have to admit uh, that I only started practicing in 2009. So I haven't seen the before 2009 one, but uh, you know, at least I can read and, and know what, what was going on. So in addition to metformin and of course, multifactorial risk factor modification, uh, before 2000, uh, the guidelines uh, all over basically focused on A1C and said the lower the A1C, the better it is doesn't matter hypoglycemia, just lower the A1C. And at that time, mostly what we had was sulfonylurea as a treatment or uh, insulin uh, as a treatment option, in addition to metformin, which is always a background in any of these, right? And then the dietary patterns uh, mostly that were in, in vogue at that time uh, were uh, the frequent small meals. And uh, you know maybe there are names uh, that, that you guys know better for this kind of a diet. But what I think of this is, is a prevention of hypoglycemia kind of a diet, right? Um, which is because we are giving you insulin and we're giving you uh, sulfonylureas, mostly short acting sulfonylureas, uh, maybe that's what is um, you know, uh, causing more hypoglycemia. And so we want you to have multiple five, six uh, small meals with carbohydrates. Uh, and, and that was the diet that was uh, recommended in many of the many of the diabetes education sessions as I understand it uh, at that time. And, and um, I have to say that uh, some uh, people with diabetes, maybe they got educated at that time, or even some uh, diabetes educators. Uh, I've, I've heard people say that, uh, you know, they heard uh, from the dietitian uh, or their educator recently 
uh, that that's the diet that they should uh, try to get is, is frequent uh, small meals. Anyway, moving beyond that, uh, there's other diets that were, um, uh, the other diet that was in vogue at that time was a low fat diet. Uh, so fat was a bad guy and uh, we should try to reduce the fat, especially the saturated fat. And that was the whole uh, diet pattern. So in place of fat, you would increase the carbohydrates uh, uh, portion uh, was, uh, was a thought at that time. And then between 2000 to 2010, all of these things kind of moved a little bit. Uh, in terms of A1C, uh, the new evolution was to not just A1C reduction, but also individualization of uh, targets. So not just a 6 or 6.5 for everyone. Um, you know, it depends on where you are and all of those other conditions. Maybe we want to be lenient in people who have recurrent hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia of unawareness, for example, or somebody who has a short life expectancy, etc. And then avoiding hypoglycemia gained more momentum. And at the same time, we got uh, drugs that did that as well. So thiazolidine diones or TZDs, and then DPP-4 inhibitors uh, were more in vogue at that time, um, uh, which uh, had less uh, risk of hypoglycemia compared to sulfonylurea and insulin, etc. And then dietary-wise, uh, balanced nutrition uh, with portion control diet. Um, so uh, the plate method, uh, et cetera, maybe uh, came into work more. Uh, so controlling the portions, not just of fat, but other uh, macronutrients uh, as well. And then the low GI diet, uh, the low glycemic index diet, as was mentioned uh, by Kathy, uh, was also uh, quite uh, popular. And then more recently, things have evolved a little bit more and uh, our targets or goals have evolved to not just focus on A1C, but have moved away from the A1C a little bit and focus more on reduction of uh, maybe coronary artery disease, heart failure, CKD, uh, kidney disease complications, et cetera. And we've had uh, you know, newer drugs uh, and outcome trials, for four or five year long trials that have uh, suggested in certain populations, uh, you know, GLP-1 and SCLD-2 inhibitor um, medications um, uh, have those uh, benefits of reducing those complications. At the same time, over the past uh, decade, especially there has been uh, you know, more literature on Mediterranean diet, which Kathy mentioned uh, actually may be the most uh, research-based uh, diet at this point. Uh, and then low-calorie diet, uh, whether it is for admission or otherwise as well. And then low-carb diets, which you already talked about, intermittent fasting. And then metabolic surgery or bariatric surgery has also uh, kind of gained uh, more precedence uh, over the past uh, decade or so uh, as well in Canada and otherwise. I'll just uh, show you, uh, you know, this evolution in another pictorial form uh, in case, uh, you know, you didn't follow what I said. Uh, this is another way of uh, showing uh, evolution from, of type 2 diabetes, how we treat it in terms of uh, pharmacotherapy, if you will, or, or, or diet, uh, the management, uh, which is encompassing diet and pharmacotherapy. So initially, when people get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, we know that beta cell function in type 2 diabetes is about 50% and keeps going down. And we, uh, the old paradigm was to start lifestyle and oral drugs. And then when that was not enough, you would initiate a basal insulin, then add a bolus insulin, then continue with an MDI or premixed insulin, and then uh, even get to carbohydrate counting in people with type 2 diabetes and maybe adjustment uh, of that. And we got quite good at doing all of this, except uh, the problem was, were we making a difference in the patient's uh, quality of life and, and in, uh, in their long-term complications or not? Right? Now, uh, some of this paradigm is changing, and I'm not saying that it's completely changed, but here are some of the changes that I think are happening. Um, so in the late stages of diabetes, where we thought, oh, we were insulin and next insulin, next insulin, maybe we are thinking how can we reduce the progression of that, right? So reducing progression of diabetes has gained uh, some momentum with the addition of non-insulin therapies to try and reduce that progression or get other complication reduction. In early diabetes, there is uh, more literature now around low calories uh, and, and, and other uh, kind of dietary patterns uh, with diabetes remission. And then diabetes prevention, especially in people with pre-diabetes, uh, has also gained uh, momentum uh, as well. So here's with that thought, the diabetes prevention, um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this uh, as a kind of a, a, a 
a teaser for next week's uh, webinar that we have uh, at Diabetes Canada. Uh, so Grace and Diabetes Canada have organized uh, this for next Thursday, uh, and you should be getting an email about this uh, webinar, uh, which is uh, next Thursday uh, around at, at the same time, 12 to one, uh, which is around the Canadian Diabetes Prevention Program. So we have a lot of uh, literature around diabetes prevention. Uh, the Canadian Diabetes Prevention Program takes that uh, same kind of approach, which is research-based to a virtual level. Uh, so it gets past that uh, need to go into a physical space, meet with a dietitian, uh, meet with uh, a coach maybe, and try to uh, change behaviors. This is all done virtually and is free. And you can see the collaborators at the bottom. So Diabetes Canada and LMC have partnered up with other uh, agencies, including um, uh, McMaster University. And then Public Health Agency of Canada, the PHAC, is what is, uh, what is uh, funding this on a major scale as well. So the idea is uh, to uh, provide the same curriculum uh, as was done in the US Diabetes Prevention Program virtually uh, to people who are at high risk. So people who have prediabetes or they have high risk on can risk is the idea. And it's a one year virtual free online kind of a program uh, that is uh, available in many of the major cities of uh, Canada. So I hope uh, that I that I uh, increased your, uh, your interest in this, uh, this field and that you'll join me uh, next week uh, for this uh, webinar, uh, which is gonna be on the same platform. Uh, so uh, next Thursday, which is July 2nd uh, at uh, 12 to one. So with that uh, appeal or teaser or advertisement, uh, let's go to our, our same question that uh, Kathy asked uh, before and see if, if there has been any uh, change in our, our answers or not. Uh, so the question is, based on what you just heard, uh, in your future consultations, uh, how many people would you, uh, would you uh, advise uh, or not? Now I realize somebody mentioned that uh, the question is worded a little differently, but maybe the choices that you get don't say a very low or a low carbohydrate diet. Of course, there's a distinction and it's important. But uh, let's assume that the, the answers actually say very low or low is what we are trying to answer uh, here as well. All right, so that's a good uh, change, uh, Kathy, wouldn't you say? Uh, uh, at least 75% of people are saying sometimes, and that's the whole idea. Uh, you know, this is not a diet for everyone, and it has many limitations in terms of research that we have and, and safety features that we've discussed. So as long as this is one of the considerations, especially if somebody's uh, you know, uh, really interested in doing this, maybe this would be a diet that they want to try out. Right? So that's the whole idea. Kathy, what do you think? Yeah, I agree, Harpreet. I think um, you know, full disclosure, when I began working on this position statement, I was kind of an anti-low carb person. Um, I like to eat a variety of foods myself, but um, the evidence is growing. And I think, um, you know, one of the questions is about, will we add the definition of low and very low carb diets um, into the guidelines? Um, and obviously that's gonna be a little while in the future, but part of the process of the next set of nutrition therapy guidelines would be to look at the position statement and the evidence that has accumulated even since the position statement was developed and um, then relook at the various recommendations regarding uh, carbohydrate and very low carbohydrate diets. I'm assuming we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, there's one here, Harpreet, that might be for you. We know that your patient should consult a dietitian, but often they don't want to, or they don't have the money to see them. So what is your recommendation for healthcare professionals to discuss, um, so non dietitians to discuss about low and very low carb diets? Yeah, so that's a, you know, an excellent question. And thanks for bringing this up. It's not just a, a dietitian's uh, job, it's all of our jobs. Uh, to uh, discuss wholesome uh, diabetes management, uh, which includes uh, you know, uh, screening for certain things, doing certain tests, et cetera, uh, talking about medications or not medications, side effects, et cetera, but also not forgetting to talk about the diet uh, parts, especially in, in people uh, who are looking for such, uh, uh, such advice uh, as well. And if they don't have uh, 
the means to do it. Uh, you know, in many provinces, uh, diabetes education is available, uh, and there are some online things that uh, that are available as well. For example, uh, you know, recently, one eight hundred Banting is Diabetes Canada's phone number uh, that has diabetes educators on call. Uh, but I mean, again, uh, if somebody calls in with a question, they respond to that person within the next day or two. I believe is is how it's working. So uh, there are uh, more and more availability of. Uh, of experts uh, with uh, with that diet part as well, uh, which is a good thing uh, to see. But I agree, everybody needs to take their part. Uh, the question about definition of low and very low carbohydrate diet. Um, so I think that was a question uh, was uh, uh, asked. And in the, I, of course, I think Grace uh, would, uh, would maybe clarify this, but uh, I think uh, the reason that uh, in your question, in your poll question, uh, in the box that you were hitting, it could not be added in to that uh, because of the word limitations or something. But in the in the document itself and what we discussed in the slides, it's very clear what we mean when we talk about low carbohydrate or very low carbohydrate uh, diet. And the literature is uh, kind of agreeable on that definition uh, as such uh, as well. Um, now in the guideline, I think this question is asking about uh, whether uh, this uh, uh, low and very low carbohydrate uh, definition would be added uh, into the guideline. I don't know if you mean position statement, which is already there, but uh, whenever the next guidelines come up, uh, I think that will be uh, you know something to consider. Uh, we don't know when the when that chapter nutrition chapter is going to be updated uh, as of now. So another question, maybe for you, Harpreet, um, as for ketoacidosis and type one. That's a concern only when carbs are less than 50 grams per day? Yeah, so that's a, you know, a good question. And, and do we have the answer to that? Unfortunately not, right? Uh, so I would advise, and, and maybe insulin is a bigger uh, role uh, to play uh, in, uh, in preventing uh, diabetes ketoacidosis acidosis than uh, the carbohydrate content itself. Uh, so, uh, um, prevention of underdosing of insulin may be the key uh, to, to try and reduce that risk rather than uh, focusing on how much carbohydrate uh, uh, or what is the amount of carbohydrate. Of course, uh, increased glucose monitoring, increase uh, you know, ketone checks uh, as, as well, uh, may be something to consider if somebody you think is, uh, is high risk, especially if they develop uh, symptoms. And this, uh, again, not, uh, you know, if, People with type 2 diabetes, you think about maybe such a diet, uh, you know, less than 5% of people uh, may, may be a good candidate as such. Uh, and then they may be, uh, you know, the people who adhere to such a diet as well, because adherence is a big problem uh, with, with any such uh, restricted diets, as we know. Uh, but in people with type 1 diabetes, it's probably five or 10 times less than people, even people with type 2 diabetes. So it's that, uh, you know, person with type 1 diabetes who's you know, up, up, up with everything. And then they want to say, oh, I want to reduce my A1C or my, my uh, glucose uh, levels a little bit. And I want to just reduce the carbohydrate content, say from 140 to uh, around of 75 uh, to 100. That's the kind of uh, approach uh, that I would uh, practically uh, suggest. Kathy, um, uh, uh, is there a position statement about intermittent fasting in the works? And do we need <laughs> such a position statement? I'll ask you. I think Grace is uh, going to weigh in on this one. Maybe? Uh, I'm I not can, sure I if there is one. That, uh, yeah, go, yeah. yeah. Well, right now, no, uh, but that's a good question. And I don't think we'll uh, get to a position statement specifically for intermittent fasting. But uh, the guidelines itself uh, is going through a revision of uh, process as such. Uh, so we're not going to have a full guideline be revised every five years, uh, like we uh, 2013, 2018. And we're not going to have a 2023 with all the guideline updates or anything. Uh, so the idea is to pick certain chapters uh, every year and to update those chapters. Uh, so maybe, uh, you know, it'll be the turn of nutrition chapter uh, in a year or two years or three years, who knows, depending on how the literature is also coming out. Uh, so that's what uh, we'll have to uh, wait for uh, as such uh, uh, as well. And then 
I know Grace is looking at me and, and saying we need to stop because we are over time. Uh, but this question is, is it a legal risk to encourage these diets knowing you cannot provide this frequent recommended uh, clinical monitoring? I think this question relates to type 1 diabetes is what you're worried about. And I, um, uh, if, if I understand it correctly, uh, uh, Kathy, what do you think? And I'll, I'll weigh in uh, after your thoughts. Well, I'm not a, a healthcare professional myself, and so I, I'm not up on all the jurisprudence uh, regulations, but I think that, you know, if you're working with a client and they are the one that initiates the discussion um, about low carb or very low carb diets, um, it, that may mitigate risk, but Harpreet, um, I'm tossing that one back to you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Kathy. No, I, I uh, so again, you know, pick uh, the uh, the person that you are uh, suggesting this, or the person is bringing to you, and and make sure that you uh, you know address or counsel them about uh, the potential risks, and make sure that you document that uh, that counseling uh, as well. So as long as uh, that is done, and the person decides to go ahead uh, and use it, uh, and and uh, you know, you discuss the counseling uh, of, of monitoring, et cetera, then I, I don't think uh, the legal risk uh, would weigh in because of that uh, counseling that, that just happened. Uh, Grace, are we done? Uh, let me, uh, so I'll say this, I'll say, I'll, I just have a few things we'll touch on and I'll let people know, people tend to sort of drop off right after one. So uh, this is being recorded and we'll, we'll continue to answer a couple more questions, but if you have to jump off, uh, know that it's being recorded, it'll be available on time, right? Probably within 24 hours or on our website next week. Um, so just a couple things I wanted to note. Yeah, tune in next week, uh, July 2nd for a uh, webinar on the Canadian Diabetes Prevention Program. We're also doing a webinar on July 7th. That's a Tuesday at noon and that's, or actually that's at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And that is a webinar about um, the disability tax credit and how as a healthcare professional, you can support your patient to be eligible for the tax credit, how to fill out the form, why, you know, um, we're gonna have Dr. Bl uh, Gary Block is gonna speak about um, how poverty affects uh, health uh, so yeah, I'm very much looking forward to that one. And on July 23rd, we're going to have a webinar about diabetes and pregnancy, just a general update um, about diabetes and pregnancy. Um, if you've enjoyed the webinar that you're watching today, it's totally free for anybody, any healthcare professional, but we'd encourage you to maybe become a professional member. If you're interested, you get access to um, a lot of benefits that uh, can help you become an expert in diabetes. So really encourage you to do that as well as Diabetes Canada could really use your financial support now more than ever. Um, so if you want to make a donation, that would be diabetes.ca slash donate. So what we'll do is you can answer as many questions stay on as long as, as, as you want. It's recorded and, and folks can uh, stay on if, you, if you'd like. Kathy, is there any question that uh, came up uh, that you want to uh, address? I think this may be a good one about uh, low carbohydrate uh, diet range of 50 to 130 grams per day. And what's a good uh, target to start with uh, within that uh, that kind of wide range? Yeah, I guess um, again, it, it could be individual uh, preference. So some people, when they start something new, want to go um, very strongly in that direction, and you know, so they might want to go as low as possible initially. Certainly for the very low carb diets, that's what um, the pattern is, is that initially the carbohydrate intake is very low and then gradually uh, it increases uh, over time. That's the general way that those diets work. Um, I guess my, and again, I'm not a healthcare professional, but I guess my bias would be to um, particularly work on the, the quality of carbohydrates with individuals and maybe worry less about the amounts um, than the actual quality, but that would be just my unprofessional uh, bias. And then uh, in the same uh, realm, uh, there's a question around supplementation of uh, maybe micronutrients, vitamins, uh, minerals, uh, etc. Um, uh, Kathy, any suggestions uh, for that? Uh, nothing specific. Um, again, I think it, it's somewhat individualized as to how people operationalize their low carbohydrate and very low carbohydrate diets. And there are some papers in the literature, I don't know if they made it into our position statement because they were more, 
predominantly focused just on weight loss, but um, they worked, the, the researchers on, on the trial and the dietitians on the trial worked very hard to make the uh, low carbohydrate, very low carbohydrate diet and the uh, lower fat diet as nutritious as possible or as healthy as possible by including those uh, for the very low carb uh, diets, uh, non-starchy vegetables. And, and so really trying to incorporate real food so much as possible that still meets the uh, carbohydrate limitations in order to um, get the fiber and uh, micronutrients that are necessary. But a multivitamin would certainly be a good place to start. And then um, other uh, deficiencies or other, not deficiencies, that's too strong a word, but um, other uh, lower intakes of, of different uh, micronutrients might have to be evaluated more specifically. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that was perfect. And and at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's it's uh, individual uh, that that you're dealing with. And you know, the other thing is uh, that uh, people say they're doing keto diet or low carb diet, but they're actually consuming carbohydrates more than they they say they're uh, consuming as well. Uh, so you have to kind of, uh, as an expert, uh, get into whether they are uh, actually adhering to or or getting into that low carbohydrate diet or what that means for them uh, as well. Um, so, uh, so it's an individual uh, uh, choice and uh, involves a lot of uh, history taking, adherence, uh, as well as uh, other uh, societal uh, factors uh, as well. Um, so there's some questions around, uh, you know, the wording and everything. It'll have to be individualized as to how you approach this. It'll be, uh, again, you know, the idea behind this uh, position statement is to put out what we know, uh, at least at this point. Uh, it's a good idea to uh, kind of individualize this uh, and then over time, this will continue to evolve uh, and then maybe more specific uh, suggestions uh, can be made into, uh, you know, when, when uh, recommending this, do this exactly or, or follow this kind of advice, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, micronutrients, for example, uh, that, that question uh, came up. And then Grace, last question to you. Uh, how can we register for the future webinars? I'm checking online, could not find the ones you just mentioned. So it's in the same place you would have registered for today's webinar. So you'd want to click on, uh, you go into the clinical practice community group and then under the events tab, um, there should be all of our upcoming webinars. Um, just loading it up here to make, yeah. So I see our diabetes prevention program webinar. You just click the register button or one on the disability tax credit and the diabetes and pregnancy um, update webinar are all there. You can just click the register button and you'll be registered for the webinar. And will there be an email uh, uh, that will be going out uh, for this as well, Grace? Yeah, there'll be emails promoting uh, these webinars with links where it will take you right to where you can uh, you can register. But they're all they're all through time right. So if you if you found today's webinar, uh, it's in the same place you registered for today's. Perfect. Um, I, I just uh, want to thank uh, Kathy and thank uh, Grace uh, and Diabetes Canada for this opportunity to uh, discuss this. Uh, hopefully this was useful uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next uh, week uh, for this uh, diabetes, Canadian Diabetes Prevention Program uh, webinar. Uh, Kathy, last words to you. <laughs> well, thanks Harpreet and uh, thanks Grace uh, and Diabetes Canada for organizing and thanks to all of the attendees. I know there was over 100 at the peak. Uh, so thank you for um, taking this in. Bye. Bye.